Okay, shall we get started? It seems like people are not scared yet, so most of you are here. Is this, com is this a comfortable seating arrangement? No, no right? That's, it's quite packed, but there's quite a bit of interest, and this is one of the largest lecture rooms, I think. I'm not sure if there is a lecture room that, uh, that, can, that can house all of us in a single room. Actually, some people are in F5, if you're, if you're, if you're aware of it. Okay, so we're going to pick up uh, where we left off yesterday, as I promised. Uh, remember, we were covering some principles and uh, talking about course goals in the meantime. And I introduced uh, uh, architecture, computer architecture, as resembling architecture, building architecture. And we talked about some Santiago College Java works, which are principal designs. And before I came uh, to ETH, I used to teach this course at Carnegie Mellon University in Pittsburgh. And I did know less about College Java at that time. After I came to ETH, I included the College Java works, which are quite interesting. But when I was at CMU, I used to actually uh, use the analogy from something else, which is this building. Has anybody been here? No? It's in the heart of Pennsylvania, uh, very close to Pittsburgh. What if I, call, I say falling water? This is basically a building called falling water. It's built on a waterfall. And at the time it was constructed, one of the, well, it was one of the most innovative designs. And it's actually still a quite innovative design. If you take Architecture 101, you will learn about this building. So basically this building is constructed on a waterfall, and you can see that the, it imitates the waterfall. It's an example of an organic architecture. And the architect of this building clearly was a principled man. He did design this building. He did not design something else. So if I ask you, what is this? It's really the masterpiece of a famous architect. Does anybody know who the architect is? So it's difficult to know who the architect is, I assume, if you don't know the building. Yes? OK, so you know the architect. Did you know the building? OK, maybe I didn't see your hand up. Yeah, that's the difficulty of being in a large room. So it's possible that people actually know, but I cannot see all the hands. Maybe a machine learning engine can do better than I do, right? It can detect all of these things because it can have sensors in all of these places. That's, that's, one, that's one area where a computer can do better than a human, I think, because I can only see a limited visual field, whereas a computer can have a much bigger visual field, as you can imagine, right? Okay, so this is the architect, Frank Lloyd Wright. He was similar to Kalat Job in many ways, in the, in the sense that he was a principled man, and he followed his principles. And he also constructed expensive buildings. Uh, and Falling Water is uh, one of these buildings, and you can see that uh, after its completion, it was Wright's most beautiful job, and it was listed among a uh, life list of 28 places to visit before you die. <laughs> Might be a good idea. I've, I would recommend it for sure. I actually went there many times while, while I was there, and I recommended my students to do the assignment over there, and I think you get inspired quite a bit. Okay, so let, if, let's take a look at this. This picture doesn't do justice to uh, Falling Water. I think the previous picture was much better. But this is one example architecture, uh, and this is another example. And clearly these have differences, right? Similar to the Stadelhofen versus your vanilla train station that I showed you earlier. This is a house, falling water, versus your vanilla house in a similar setting. Uh, clearly there are many differences over here, which I'm not going to go into. Cost is one difference, but performance could be another difference over here. Uh, I don't know, aesthetics is another difference over here. Clearly, this is not listed as one of the places that you must see before you die. <laughs> I can guarantee you that. <laughs> uh, but it's not a bad place to live also, right? So it's, it's, it's all about the trade-off that you're making uh, in the design. Okay, so again, I will not go through all of this. We talked about Kalatrava. I can go through many, many architects related to this. But clearly, uh, this was a masterpiece, and the architect was able to design it. And there all, there's a lot that goes into that design, very similar to when you design computer, computer architectures, actually, computing platforms. A lot of these actually play into that also. But I will focus especially on the last two, as I mentioned earlier. Basically, you need to have a very strong understanding and commitment to fundamentals, as well as principal designs. And clearly, there are principles behind these designs. And in, in this course, our goal, my, my major goal is really to give you those principles in the design of computer architectures, how a computer works from the ground up so that you can see those good principles. Because some of the good principles, even though the computing architectures change and evolve, the principles always remain. OK. And you will, you will also uncover some of these other skills, hopefully. Right. 
Uh, okay, so this is the quote from the architect himself, actually. Uh, he was a hard-headed man, uh, Frank Lloyd Wright, and he said, basically, architecture should be based upon principle and not upon, upon precedent. Precedent is what comes before. So it's very easy to replicate what comes before. And I think this is actually a good quote to apply in many areas of life, not just design itself, right? If you think about law, uh, legal systems, uh, should it be based on principle or should it be based on precedent? Sometimes it's a combination of both, actually. But you can always argue that it should really be based on principle, but not precedent, because precedent may be wrong, right? There have been legal systems where uh, uh, law was discriminating against people, right? Does that mean the precedent is correct? And principles can be maybe, maybe all, may also be wrong, right? So it's good to keep that in mind. And I think uh, uh, architecture in general is a very broad field, and computer architecture is a very smaller incarnation of it, but I think it's good to think about uh, this philosophical implications of how you're designing a system going into the future also. Actually, especially machine learning systems have some a flavor of what I just mentioned, right? You design a machine learning system, it's learning from some data, and your data may be completely biased, right? In the end, the decisions you make may be completely biased. Right? Actually, we've seen many examples uh, that uh, machine learning systems, because of the way they learn, uh, they associate some particular uh, jobs, let's say, with a particular gender. Because that's the way it is, and they learn based on that. And if, if someone says, talks about a doctor, and if the machine learning system is translating it to a language that, has, that is, that is gender-based, that becomes a he, right? Because there's bias in the data through which the machine learning system is trained, right? That's, that's just the way the data is, right? But that doesn't mean that that precedent, which is the data, should dictate what happens into the system going into the future, right? So this is good to keep in mind. You can actually read about this. There are actually really interesting studies that show how uh, language translation systems are biased uh, when they actually are learning from data and when they do the translation, because they have to pick a pronoun, he or she. And when they actually do the translation for a particular, uh, for doctor, they pick the he. And when they actually do the translation for, I don't know, teacher, let's say, uh, or nurse, that's better actually, perhaps, they, they pick the she. And that becomes the norm going into the future. And we rely on these systems even though they're completely biased, right? That's not necessarily a good thing going into the future. We don't, we don't want to be the slaves of this precedent, uh, which is really biased in the end. Okay, anyway, that's, I, I harped on this because I think this is really important. I mean, this, this person clearly didn't envision machine learning systems going into the future, but this applies to a lot of things that we design. It's, he, he, he clearly thought about design itself, and machine learning systems are part of the design that we're doing going into the future, and they're computing platform designs. Okay. Well, because he didn't want the precedent-based design, he didn't replicate, or he, could, he didn't incrementally improve something like this. He did something completely different that no one ever else, no one ever taught of in the, in the past. And this is actually based on his principle, organic architecture. You can read about it. Uh, it's very interesting, but I'm not going to harp on it again. Again, basically, it's a flat field architecture which promotes harmony between human habitation and the natural world through design approaches that actually combine both in some sense. Okay, so principle design and also strong understanding of and commitment to fundamentals. So let me do the takeaways before we go into some other things. Basically, I think uh, my, uh, the reason I actually uh, talked about a lot of these examples is because I would like to mention that it all starts from the basic building blocks and design principles. We're going to design computers in this course, and uh, we need those principles. And uh, we also want the knowledge and of how to use and when to apply them. That's really important. Uh, Again, as I said earlier, underlying technology may change. Underlying context may change. It may be architecture, building architecture. It may be computing architecture. It may be a machine learning system. But all of those might change, but uh, principles remain the same. In the, in the case of building architecture, you may be constructing something with steel versus wood. But methods of taking advantage of technology bear resemblance. They may not be exactly the same, but some of the principles remain. And methods used for design depend on the principles that are employed. So let me give you a very uh, high-level examples. Right? Uh, basically, all of these are multi-core engines at some point. These, this is a relatively old slide, so it doesn't have the latest and greatest multi-core engine that, you may, that be, you may have in your pocket. But these are all based on the same building blocks in the end. Transistors, logic gates, and memories, uh, caches, interconnects. 
but you apply the principles uh, in, a, in different ways to, uh, to cover different trade-offs to de design different systems. Anyway, we're going to see actually pretty much all of these in the lecture, but we're not going to, of course, talk about every single one in detail. But we're going to see the principles that build up a GPU, for example. This is a GPU. At that time, it had 448 cores. Now, right now, actually, its GPUs are much larger. As you've seen yesterday, there was a chip that had 400,000 cores. It was not a GPU, but it was a machine learning accelerator. So there are other computers. There are basic building blocks uh, and design principles that go into them. I'm going to go through this relatively quickly. And these basic building blocks remain the same, actually. OK, this is what I mentioned just now, actually. So this is a jogger memory. So what are those basic building blocks? These are actually what we're going to learn. Uh, hopefully, you'll learn about electrons, as I mentioned yesterday. So we're not going to cover electrons. But we're going to start with transistors, and then build logic gates, and then build combinational and sequential logic circuits. Uh, sequential logic circuits are the ones that provide storage elements and memory so that you can remember. Combinational logic doesn't remember. It just computes. Uh, and we're going to build other uh, building blocks on top of these cores, caches, interconnect, and memories. And we're going to talk about how to actually interconnect these things or combine these things so that we can actually do computations in a much faster way. Does that sound interesting? OK, so hopefully we're, we're going to cover a lot of principles that are employed in existing systems. So basically, you will get to know a lot of stuff that's inside here. OK, so but I guess uh, you have to pay something to get something. And your payment is studying hard. <laughs> Does that sound fair? And there are two books I recommend in this course. Uh, I mean, you can follow either one, uh, especially when I recommend both of them. I would, I would suggest reading both of them. But in the end, you're not really required to read anything, in the, uh, even though I call these required reading assignments. Uh, you, can, you can do very well in this course as long as you understand the material and uh, uh, what I talk about in lectures, and you do the assignments, especially the homework assignments that we put out, which are not graded, but you can do them on your own because there are solutions out there. So, but, the, but the reading assignments will help you get to a point where you understand things a lot more. And these two books are very different in their approach. I really like both of them, actually, and it's very hard to pick one of them. And in general, I don't want, to buy, I don't want people to be biased in one side. That's why I actually go through two books. In fact, if you have this opportunity, it's good to compare the approaches of two books. They're different approaches educationally and pedagogically. That's why I keep these two books. But don't feel, if you think that reading is a lot, don't feel compelled to read both. You can pick one. You can pick your favorite. You can do some profiling and say, OK, I like this one better, and go with that. Right. So that's the idea. We will cover the material in the class anyway, uh, the material that you will be responsible for. This is really for your deeper understanding. So, this is today for this week's reading assignments, which you should hopefully do by next week. Uh, chapter one in Harris and Harris, and chapter one and two in Pat and Patel. These are basically really the principles that you need to get started. And this is something that you should really do on your own. I'm not going to talk about this. Hopefully, people know about binary numbers. Have you studied binary numbers? OK, that's good. That's why I don't want to cover it, because it's a really boring lecture. <laughs> so study this on your own. It's going to be very easy. Uh, if you have questions, let me or the TAs know. So there's, uh, there are lecture slides on binary numbers. OK. OK, so what are the goals of this course? That was part of the like, title, right? Basically, uh, we are going to look at uh, digital circuits and computer architecture, or digital design and computer architecture. And uh, my goal is to enable you to understand the basics, understand the principles of design, and understand also the precedents. So precedents are important because you should know what comes before so that you can do better than that. So Frank Lloyd Wright knew what came before, and he did better than that. And whenever you actually know what came before, like this, you can do much better than that. Right? I can do much better than that, I can claim. But I don't have time to do much better than that. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> that's a joke. <laughs> so based on such understanding, uh, hopefully you will learn how a mo modern uh, computer works underneath. Evaluate the trade-offs of different designs and ideas. Uh, Implement a principal design. You will basically implement a simple microprocessor. And hopefully, you will learn to systematically debug increasingly complex systems, because you will have to do some debugging while you're doing the, implementing this principal design on an FPGA board. Initially, we will start with simulation, and then you will use an FPGA board to actually implement this very, very simple microprocessor. And hopefully, all of this will enable you to develop, at some point, new out-of-the-box designs. Not necessarily in this course, but going into the future, it will help your education. 
And again, my focus is on basics, principles, and precedents, and how to use them to create and implement good designs. Trade-offs are really important. We're going to cover a lot of trade-offs, because as, hopefully, uh, as it is clear, there is no right or wrong, in a sense. It all depends on what you're going to, uh, what your target is, what your design goals are, and what kind of trade-offs you're trying to make to achieve that design goal, right? You can achieve a design goal in multiple different ways, but the question is, what, what are the trade-offs to do there? And every single idea has an upside and a downside. There is no idea that only has upsides or only has downsides. Every single idea has an upside and a downside. And upsides and downsides can sometimes depend on the context in which the idea is used. So we will see that uh, when we come to uh, discuss a lot of ideas. OK, so why these goals? Uh, well, hopefully, because you are here for a computer science degree. How many people are here for a computer science degree? OK, how many people are here for electrical engineering? OK, I could easily replace this with electrical engineering. I think it's the same, basically, in the end. It's really a continuum, uh, electrical engineering, computer science. But anyway, uh, regardless of your future direction, learning the principles of digital design and computer architecture will also be useful uh, to design better hardware, design better software, because once you understand the hardware, you could do much better with software. You can design better systems in the end, algorithm architecture co-designs that we talked a lot about yesterday. Uh, you can make better trade-offs in design, and hopefully we can make better trade-offs in uh, other designs, not necessarily computing uh, designs, but designs that you see out in the world, right? A tram, for example, like we discussed yesterday. Right? You can understand why computers behave the way do they do, uh, and solve problems better, hopefully. I think these are more problem-solving uh, directions that I'm also very, very interested in. Not necessarily the knowledge that you get, but also the thinking uh, that you will develop out of this course, especially when you're thinking about the different trade-offs. Hopefully, you'll be able to think in parallel, because you're actually going to design things that are going to operate naturally in parallel. Hardware, actually, is completely parallel. Because when you look at a hardware design, a lot of signals will be happening at the same time concurrently. And when you're designing hardware, you have to think in parallel to make sure that all of those signals do the thing that you really want that hardware to do in a given clock cycle. We'll talk about the clock cycle also. OK, and then hopefully you will think critically. That's really important, uh, because whenever you see an idea, you should be able to think critically. Like whenever you see the two designs that I showed you, falling water versus the vanilla house in the middle of the woods, you can think critically to uh, decide uh, the different trade-offs. Any questions? OK, so I'll go through these slides relatively quickly. I'm going to give you the course info on logistics. These will be up online. And uh, you can ask questions about them later on also. I don't want to spend valuable lecture time going through uh, these nitty gritty uh, in detail. I'm going to focus on a, a, a few things. I mean, I just introduced myself yesterday, so hopefully you know all about this. Uh, we have a large team uh, that will be uh, giving lectures as well as providing uh, assistance. Uh, our head assistant is Juan over there. Juan, so you should know him. Uh, Hassan, who is not here right now, uh, is the vice assistant. He's my PhD student. Frank will sometimes uh, come give lectures. Uh, uh, he uh, is also a lecturer in this course. He's not here right now. But there are also other key assistants and guest lecturers. Mohammed, Lois, Jawad, Dissun. I'm not going to introduce them all because they're not all here necessarily, but you'll get to know them. And Minesh, Girai, John, Geraldo, Rahul, and Konstantinos. So a lot of them are doing actually their PhDs, or they've already done their PhDs in computer architecture. So they're experts in these area. OK. And they're also student assistants. Uh, most of these folks have taken these, this course in the past. Actually, some of them have taken this course, uh, TA this course, uh, uh, assisted this course multiple times. So they're seasoned assistants. They're going to help you, especially with the labs. OK. And there are labs that you should sign up for. Uh, and we're going to assign the assistants to them. That's why those are all TB TBD. So this is important. Whenever you need help, Post your question to the Q&A forum. Uh, sometimes your fellow students can answer it. Sometimes we can answer it. So that's the best way, actually, to get help. Uh, you can also write an email, especially if it's a private issue, to the instructor, myself, uh, or this list, uh, which goes to all of the uh, myself as well as the assistants. You can come to office hours, and they're listed. I'm not going to go through them. You can find them. This may change over time. We'll announce the changes. And if you really want to know what's going on, you should really go to the website. How many people visit the website of the course? OK, that's good. So you know, and you can find it. Basically, everything is in the website. Uh, if you didn't come to lectures, if you don't want to come to the lectures, you can go to the website and click on the videos and watch them, right? That's, 
uh, and click on the PDFs and download them and look at uh, our PowerPoints and uh, go and play them at your pace. So you can take this course at your own pace, essentially. Uh, okay, basically the website is really a single point of access to all resources. And we, you, will, you should also check your ATH email because we may send email related to the assignments over there. Uh, and of course, you can consult the, myself and the teaching assistants as well. Okay, you know when the lectures are, I already said this, attendance is for your benefit. I don't require anything. We don't take attendance. Uh, and hopefully attendance is useful, uh, so you will value it. But if you don't value it, that's fine also. <laughs> I don't mind. <laughs> Uh, okay, some days we will have guest lectures and exercise sessions, but we will see, that's dynamically. Okay, lab sessions are online, and you should definitely attend the lab sessions. Uh, again, uh, I don't believe we take attendance over there, but uh, you will need to do the labs to actually pass the course. Uh, and you will need to provide mandatory lab reports. And labs will start, this is next week, right? February 28th? Okay, next week. Next Friday, I think. Okay, and you can find the handouts over here. So for the labs, uh, choose your preferred group in Moodle. You can, uh, uh, these slides are already online actually, you can go and link, uh, click on those links and choose your preferred group, choose your partner. And if you've taken this course in the past and if you want to use your lab grades from previous years, there's a procedure that you should follow and you can see that procedure online. Final exam is a part of the evaluation. I think it's the 70% of the grade. It's a uh, 180 minute written exam and uh, basically, you can find the examination rules. I'm not going to go through them right now. Uh, also, you can find the, them in the first page of the previous exams. And all of our previous exams are online. So you can actually go and look at the exams and look at what kind of questions may come up. And you can see that the questions, a lot of the questions are actually predictable, but they require you to understand material, basically. Uh, like I have, uh, I have a favorite GPU, graphics processing unit question I always ask on exams, and you will see that. It's a, it's a great question. I mean, whenever you change the question, uh, you need to know what's going on to really be able to uh, answer that question, essentially. You cannot just memorize an answer and actually uh, solve the question. But if you know the principles, then you can solve that question relatively easily. OK. Uh, OK, basically, some exam questions are similar to question the optional homeworks. And optional homeworks actually incorporate some questions in past exams also. So it's, a, it's an interesting loop here. <laughs> But, uh, but I, uh, it's not all, but I didn't say all over here. Sometimes you may get a question that tests understanding, but that's not necessarily exactly the same uh, flavor of what we've asked in an exam, uh, 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 in a past homework. And that tests understanding also, clearly. So optional homeworks are optional, but they're highly recommended. So I would recommend doing those. I'd recommend going through the past exams also. Okay, I think that's uh, all I have uh, for logistics. Basically, these are the reading assignments for this week. Please do them as, uh, at your pace. These are the leading assignments for next week, meaning we're going to cover combination logic and uh, more uh, coming, coming from next week. And you can also check the course website for all future readings. We will have required readings, recommended readings, and mentioned readings. Uh, required readings are things that are really directly uh, covered in lecture. But clearly, we didn't cover everything in the reading, because reading is much longer than the lecture. But also, I sometimes cover stuff that's not in the reading. So you should be careful about that also. No, nobody uh, actually wrote about what we covered in the previous lectures. It's not in the papers. It's not in the books. OK. Any questions? Otherwise, we're going to switch to lecture 2B.